so i will start uh, the evaluation of cardiac risk prior to non cardiac surgery uh, i assume that the slides are visible for you and i am audible so essentially what we are going to try and do is evaluation of the cardiac risk or for a patient who comes in for non cardiac surgery uh, this is a this has been a huge take off from the acc aha presentation or the publication that came up in uh, which started coming up the last one that i think uh, appeared is in 2014 we have had few focused updates after that and possibly awaiting a newer one but till then we will have to deal with that plus there are certain things which are not there in the acc aha which will uh, possibly we will deal it uh, deal with it over here uh, we all understand that uh, major non cardiac surgery there is always a risk of cardiovascular event and uh, the risk of cardiovascular event is related to the patient so there are certain patient specific characteristics especially those who have a background cardiovascular disease and also the procedure involved and identification which is the essential premise of this uh, next half an hour 45 minutes this identification of the risk provides the surgeon the patient the anesthesiologist with information that helps them better understand the benefit to risk ratio of that particular procedure and therefore helps them to take a decision as to whether they would be happy to take that increased risk or there is no risk at all and we can possibly go ahead and it can also lead to intervention that can possibly decrease the risk uh if you look through data and this is from the american college of surgeons uh, the national database on quality on in improvement program and they looked at their data from 2004 to 2013 and when they looked at non cardiac surgery uh, and you they are looking at major adverse cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events that is in hospital all cause death acute mi or acute ischemic stroke it is happening at in the rate of around 3% so that's that not's not a insignificant rate that's pretty significant and uh, these were happening more commonly in patients undergoing vascular surgery thoracic surgery and transplant surgery so that is why we need to be aware and be careful about this so what we will go through today is uh, the approach of a patient and uh, looking at the patient looking at the surgical procedure how we do the initial ev evaluation what are the risk factors how can we do the risk assessment and uh, the management based on risk is what flow that we take in we will not possibly deal with it and then we you will not go to bed by 12 midnight tonight so we will not discuss about how you can uh, somebody with a problem how what you do to manage it but rather the flow through which the patient should go through and is there any role of doing further cardiac testing so this is what we will try and go through a practical approach before we start the deliberations uh, we will have certain poll question this is fun this is to kind of uh, uh, kind of make it interactive so if you can uh, Jyoti, if you can get the poll questions ready, we will go through the poll questions. Yes, so, sir. Thank you very much. So all you have to do this is uh, this is completely confidential. You you know it is not revealed who is uh, hitting which option. So please feel free to hit it, and we will go back to it, which is essentially the take home message from the deliberation will be the answers to the poll questions. So the first poll question that comes up is. which of these statement is not true so one of these is not true okay all patients scheduled to undergo non cardiac surgery should have an assessment of the risk of cardiovascular perioperative cardiac event the second statement is patient's functional status is an important determinant of risk the third statement is identification of risk factors is derived from the history and physical examination the fourth 
statement is the type of proposed surgery does not influence the risk of perioperative cardiac event. Which of these do you think is not true? So just uh, choose which is not true. A tick mark should appear and then you can vote. Okay, so if you are, I think this is very straightforward. If you're good, we will close this poll and go to the next poll in five, four, three, two, one, zero. So this second poll question is, I think this will be extensively dealt with. Which of the following is again not a part of the revised cardiac risk index? The Lee's cardiac risk index and then, then the revised cardiac risk index has, as you all know, possibly that there are six of them. Which of these four is not a part? It is, it is only one of these is correct. So which is not a poll? So can we uh, set up the poll, start the poll? Is it congestive heart failure? Is it cerebrovascular disease, hypertensive on true drugs, or a serum creatinine of greater than 2 milligrams per DL? So one of them is not a part of the revised cardiac risk index. Which do you think is not a part of the revised cardiac risk index? Is it congestive heart failure, cerebrovascular disease, Hypertensive on two drugs or a serum creatinine of greater than two milligram per DL. Please choose only one option and uh, vote. And we'll close the poll in 05, 04, 03, 02, 01, 0. And we'll go to the next poll question. All right. So the third port question, this is a kind of your approach. So there is a 68-year-old male with a history of CABG done. Also, is a known case of COPD and has developed gallstone pancreatitis and is being posted for laparoscopic cholecystectomy. On assessment, you find that he has a uh, grade of angina, which is CCS3, a grade of dyspnea, which is NYHA3, is the heart rate of 60, 98 per minute. The chest X-ray looks okay. The ECT shows ST changes in the anterolateral leads. The labs are okay. What would be your approach? Cardiologic consultation, coronary angiogram, revascularization, and then take up for cholecystectomy? Or is it just cardiologic consultation? You get a cardiologic clearance and you go proceed for surgery. Or is it be cardiologic consultation? You optimize the medical management and the symptoms, heart rate control, then proceed for surgery. Or do you think you should send it to the cardiothoracic surgeon, post CABG status, redo CABG, a cholecystectomy in the same setting. What would be your preferred approach? 68 year old, past history of CABG, known case of COPD, gallstone pancreatitis, plan is a laparoscopic cholecystectomy as CCS3, NYHA3 symptoms. Heart rate 98, chest X-ray okay, ECG ST changes in the anterolateral leads, labs are okay. So what would be your preferred approach? Coronary angiogram revascularization and only then take up. Cardiologic consult, cardiologic clearance, proceed for surgery. Cardiologic consult, optimize medical management, heart rate control, proceed for surgery. Or is it cardiothoracic surgery who decides to do a redo CABG and uh, cholecystectomy in the same setting? 
choose your option and we'll close the poll in five, four, three, two, one, and zero. And we'll go to the next poll question. Okay. So this is a 56 year old female who has is known to have a stenotic mitral valve. The recent echocardiogram shows a mitral valve area of 1.4 square centimeter and has a reasonably good functional status. She is not short of breath and does not impair her day to day activity. On ECG, you find that there is atrial fibrillation with a ventricular rate of 106 per minute. She's got a CA ovary which needs surgery. The lab reports are normal. What would be your approach? No further cardiac testing and you proceed for surgery. Or is it a cardiologic consultation, heart rate control and then proceed for surgery? Mitral valve replacement and then see ovary surgery or would it be you just offer radiotherapy and chemotherapy or discourage surgery. So a known patient with mitral stenosis with a mitral valve orifice area of 1.4 square centimeter with good functional status, no shortness of breath, AF with a ventricular rate of 106, need surgery for CA ovary, what would be your approach? No further cardiac testing, proceed for surgery, cardiologic consultation, heart rate control, and then proceed for surgery, or is it mitral valve replacement, and then proceed for surgery, or just offer radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and discourage surgery? So if you are decided, please think of which option to take and uh, we will then close the poll in five, four, three, two, one, zero. And we will get back to you with the answers to the poll at the very end. Thank you very much for bearing up with this poll. And now we will proceed towards how we approach towards assessment of cardiovascular risk. See, the two main pillars or column, columns or whatever you call are the patient and the type of surgery. In the patient, you are looking at the type of the disease, whether it is ischemic or it is pumping or is it valvular or whatever it is and the severity of the disease and is there any associated disease along with the cardiovascular disease and in the type of surgery the two important thing is uh, when does the surgery need to happen the timing of the surgery is it emergency or is it can it wait and is it an elective low equity surgeries or is it an intermediate equity time sensitive surgeries or it is the high equity urgent surgeries and the invasive nerve surgery is it the very surface surgeries or it does it involve excessive fluid shift blood loss major invasive surgery major hemodynamic perturbations so these will influence how we are going to assess the cardiovascular risk now are all patients with some history of cardiovascular disease somebody who has said that he had chest pain four years back is now on aspirin and some nitrate is doing well does his work somebody who's had two stents maybe one in the lad one in the rca but is very good functional is that person with high risk so who are these patients who are high risk you see, these patients who are at high risk are not are those who just had an MI quick, maybe in the last couple of months, has unstable angina with, with medications, without medications, so suboptimal medications possibly, uh, decompensated heart failure, not necessarily somebody who, is, who was uh, admitted for heart failure long back, now is fine, decompensated heart failure, high-grade arrhythmias, 
things like what uh, Dr. Gaurav also talked about, the less my Mobis type two or uh, a third degree heart block or uh, AF with a high ventricular rate or some uh, of any of the supraventricular uh, or any of the ventricular arrhythmias. So those are the high grade arrhythmias we need. If they have, it's a high risk. And hemodynamically important valvular heart disease like aortic stenosis or possibly even mitral stenosis. These are the patients who are at high risk and you need to be worried about them because these group of patients has a very high risk of going in and having a perioperative MI or possibly in heart failure. Can They can go into VF or may I have a, just a primary cardiac arrest, complete heart block and even a cardiac mortality. So these, this is why you need to assess, are they in that group and should I, then should I be careful? And therefore, they need to be optimally treated. And they, if, if, if you find that they have those kind of uh, things that are there with them, refer it to the specialist for evaluation and manage them before you take up for an elective non-cardiac surgery. I think that is the premise of this uh, entire deliberation. Uh, how urgent is the surgery? Extremely important. Uh, emergency surgery, which needs to happen within six hours, urgent surgery, which needs to happen within a day, or is it a time sensitive, which can be delayed till one to six weeks, the so-called high equity surgeries or intermediate equity surgeries, and elective, which can be delayed up to one year, very, very few to far and far between, like other than the arthroplasties and uh, maybe certain reconstructive uh, plastic surgeries, which can delay up to one year. So uh, essentially, again, depending upon the type of surgery, do you have how, how much of time do you have to optimize and assess is dependent upon this uh, subset, which is the surgery that needs to happen. So. Patients undergoing emergency or urgent surgery are at a much increased risk of perioperative cardiovascular event at any level of a baseline risk. And you cannot just uh, corroborate uh, risk indexes which are in and the elective surgery co cohorts and they will never be accurate. Uh, to tell you what would be the risk in emergency or urgent surgery. It uh, we will realize it goes up to two, four times, five times the uh, risk uh, uh, that you would expect in elective surgery. Because you would not have sufficient time for an extensive evaluation of the severity of the patient's cardiovascular problem. And if you cannot assess the severity, you will not be able to optimize. And you are definitely it is because of the urgency of surgery, because the benefit of going in for surgery is far, far more than optimization, which is why you cannot do additional testing and you will have to accept that risk and go ahead. Or thing is, you will have to realize that whatever you are doing in the preoperative, intraoperative period, you have to keep carrying on into the postoperative period. Understand that there might be possible cardiovascular complications and you need to be aware and possibly manage it in a setting where you can manage such things. So coming now to the initial preoperative evaluation for the risk of a cardiovascular complication. When does this happen? Who does it? And how much should a cardiologist be involved in this? The answer to these are, that it happens from the time it is decided that a non-cardiac surgery will need to be considered. Who does it? It starts with the primary care clinician. So it can be this, uh, if it was with, a, uh, with the person's GP, maybe that, or maybe the surgeon, and you have to be lucky to get a surgeon who understands that as well. And, or it could be, uh, it can start from the pre-anesthesia clinic as well. A cardiologist will definitely be involved, especially if there is an elevated cardiovascular risk and you need, and you possibly think it needs further evaluation, maybe also optimization and maybe some kind of intervention before the person goes in for a non cardiac surgery. So, what inquiries are done in the initial preoperative evaluation? It's basically you try to find out the symptoms and the past history. The current symptoms, are there any current symptoms which suggest angina, dyspnea? Is there any symptoms uh, uh, suggestive or complaint suggestive of syncope or 
does the patient have palpitations these four are very are something which should immediately uh, 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 get you going and say that this person needs more attention and from the history there are certain things that you want to find out does the person have history of ischemic heart disease what have been the interventions has the person undergone revascularization what kind of anti anginal or other cardiac medications the patient has been does the patient have valvular disorder is there anything that along with the valvular what are what is happening to the chambers of the heart uh, are, what are kind of medications are the patient is on is the uh, on rate control or uh, for 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 uh, uh, medications to reduce thromboembolic events all these things you need to elicit over here does the patient have associated hypertension diabetes uh chronic kidney disease or uh, uh, or cerebrovascular or a peripheral arterial disease so these are the things that you need to find out in the initial entry uh in the examination uh you find out the blood pressure the auscultation of the heart and lungs uh, abdominal palpation examination of the extremities for edema and vascular integrity things that are worrying and which should be looked for carefully are evidence of heart failure and is can you pick up any murmur which can be uh, which is suspicious of an hemodynamically significant valvular heart disease so these are the things that you need to look for in the examination in the uh, early on a lot of the initial preoperative evaluation rests on finding out what is the patient's functional status how is he doing with the disease that he has how is he coping with the disease and this is expressed in form of metabolic equivalents and uh, a metabolic equivalent is nothing but one met is 3.5 ml oxygen uptake per kg per minute which is nothing but the resting oxygen uptake in a sitting position and if you find that the person's through your questions if you find that the person has a score of 4 mets and above uh activity the, then you are kind of okay that this is a good prognostic indicator and the patient should not do very badly with non cardiac surgery uh how do you find out the mets this is a very subjective way of doing it one met is like taking care of self looking uh, like that person can eat dress and use the toilet is one met uh if the person can climb a flight of stairs or walk uphill on with a slope with at a reasonable pace then you say that uh, these if this kind of activities are done then you per se that the person has a met score of around 4 uh if he can do a little more strenuous physical activity you say like scrubbing floors etc lifting furniture and i think uh, in, in, during this last 3 or 4 months of lockdown if you have been managing your own house pretty well and if it's neat and clean you can be sure that you have a met score between 4 and 10 uh, and somebody who can take part in strenuous uh, sports like swimming tennis single tennis football has a met score of uh, 10 and above so this is a, a subjective way of finding out the functional status we i think we're very happy from the time at least i was very happy looking at met scores from maybe 2004 5 onwards till 2018 and then the question now comes is met score a very reliable tool for functional assessment and this is because of this met's 2018 study which was published in lancet and this is from the vijay sundara group and this is a multi centric multinational trial from australia new zealand canada us and some countries in the in europe and they were trying to look at uh, pre operative subject assessments with these uh, met scores and the alternative markers of fitness like the extensive cardiopulmonary exercise testing they brought in the basis on which the met scores were developed which is the duke activity status index questionnaire the dasi questionnaire and they were also looking at serum nt and pro bnp concentrations and the primary outcomes they were looking at can these predict death or complications after major elective non cardiac surgery uh 
they found that major non-cardiac surgery and with at least one or more risk factors. And what did they find? They found that when you're looking at MET scores, it had just 19.2% sensitivity. So it had a reasonably good specificity. And this sensitivity was to, uh, to like when you are actually from after the person is doing a CPET study uh, at the entire uh, the at the lab to actually figure out that what is four mets and what we think and we we're sub giving them the four met scores that it had just a 19.2 percent sensitivity and therefore it had very poor association with predicting the primary outcome which is major adverse event for a major non-cardiac surgery. However, the DASI scores were associated with a much uh, higher sensitivity in predicting the primary outcome. And you can see that it is uh, the, uh, the, the, with the uh, CI of 0.83, so it is between less than one. And they found that if it, there was a DASI score of less than 34, then these patients were definitely associated with the increased risk of 30-day death, MI, and if moderate to severe complications. What was very surprising from the METS 2018 study was that from the elaborate CPET study, where they looked into peak oxygen consumption and anaerobic threshold, these were not associated with moderate to severe complications and they could not predict, uh, be predictive of the primary at outcome as well. So the interpretation from the METS 2018 study, that is uh, the authors as well as to me, is that a subjective assessment like functional uh, capacity with just assigning METS scores is possibly not as good for preoperative risk as evaluation. And maybe we think of going back to the Duke Activity Status Index for cardiac risk assessment. So this METS 2018 made me revisit this chart and kind of tell me that this is the one and I need to take a little more time in figuring out their preoperative cardiac risk. And it is essentially, again, their own physical status. Like, can you take care of yourself? Like that one that we assign one mat, you give a score of 2.75. Walk a block on level ground, you give 2.75. You can climb a flight of stairs, you give a higher score like 5.5. And if you can run a short distance, you give a higher score of 8. And based upon this, if you get a total score, cumulative score of above 34, then you say that this person possibly has a much higher chance of doing well. So that four METs possibly needs to be replaced with this more elaborate, but possibly more accurate DASI scores. So maybe it looks for a call in how we evaluate patients in the preoperative. Maybe the next ACC AHA guideline could change based on this. So what models are used for risk assessment? I think the most popular one is definitely the one that was initially given by Lee and still goes by the name of Lee's Revised Cardiac Risk Index. There is, uh, of course, this Gupta myocardial. And the reason I like it is because it is, has part of my name in it. And or maybe many people in North America are falling on to this, which is the American College of Surgeons, the ns uh, calculator the National Surgical Quality Improvement Plan calculator. And uh, all these models incorporate certain factors. If you look at it, it uh, whatever was is there in the RCRI are all there also in the NSQIP, uh, like the surgery specific risk index. So what is the kind of surgery? Is it a major vascular surgery or is it major uh, invasive uh, uh, cavity surgeries? Does the patient have ischemic heart disease? Does the patient have heart failure? Does the patient have history of cerebrovascular disease? Does the patient have an associated diabetes mellitus, which is insulin dependent? Does the patient have renal dysfunction with a serum creatinine of greater than two? Uh, these are classic RCRIs. And 
in the ns twip you'll find that uh, there is things like increased age the acps and also preoperative functional status and they are trying to incorporate the dasi score to these i think i feel and many others also feel uh, there is i think there is a huge amount of evidence uh, coming up on this that along with this i think there are two things people have left out which are extremely important in saying that if they have this there is a higher risk of a uh, post operative adverse cardiovascular event which is atrial fibrillation and obesity uh as we were talking uh, surgery involves risks so there are certain surgeries which are called the high risk procedures where the uh, incidence of a major adverse cardiac event could be more than 5% there are intermediate group which is between 1 and 5 and we say there are certain low risk procedures where the incidence is going to be less than 1% and uh, it can change based upon institutions who have got expertise in dealing with this particular scenario or the surgeon and emergency surgery we talked about this initially can have a much 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 higher risk of 2 to 5 times than with elective procedures and if you look at it and this is a very elegant study and publication which was done in 2018 by liu and what they did was uh, they took a patient like a 67 year old female with hypertension and diabetes which required oral therapy obese who is functionally independent does not smoke and is an asa physical status 2 and what is the cardiovascular risk if the person go undergoes this kind of surgeries if it's a busy slide it may not be that easily but what they were trying to see that things like partial mastectomy arthroscopic rotator cuff had a much estimated lower cardiac risk then suppose a more invasive things like a whipples procedure pylorus sparing which has a much higher uh, kind of uh, risk like an odds ratio of 4.7 uh, this actually gave gave us an idea also which many people kept on talking but uh, there was no very not hardcore evidence that laparoscopic surgeries are now people are realizing possibly has lesser risks of a, a cardiac complication or cardiac risk when you're looking at a composite 30 day data than open surgeries like a lap coli will have less a uh, lesser odds ratio than an open cholecystectomy a lap ventral hernia possibly will have a lesser odds ratio than an open ventral hernia but essentially this is to show that uh, uh, kind of with the same given uh, a patient factor how much the surgical factor influences the perioperative risk and this is something that was there in the previous 2007 and in the 2009 accha guidelines i still like it much better than just two classifications of mace less than 1% and greater than 1% it kind of tells me that something like an aortic uh, surgery or uh, a surgery on the aorta or a major vascular surgery Uh, or even a peripheral arterial surgery has a higher risk than uh, orthopedic surgery or even an invasive surgery like an intraperitoneal or intrathoracic surgery and superficial surgeries are the ones which has a mace risk of less than 1%. So this is surgery and how it influences risks. So the adverse perioperative risk and all this is because it is giving you in percentage some number some objectivity and you are getting it from the history physical examination some investigation and the type of surgery it helps you to again convince yourself convince the surgeon convince the cardiologist convince the patient convince the patient relatives as to then the decision making should we proceed for surgery or should we not proceed for surgery without cor correcting the problem or should we give them some alternative at the same time this risk assessment might uncover undiagnosed problems or suboptimally treated prior conditions that need attention and these risk calculators will just look at the lee's revised cardiac risk index the six factors in that i'm keep i'm coming back on this the type of surgery history of ischemic heart disease history of heart failure history of cerebrovascular disease diabetes requiring insulin i have a little bit of an uh, if, uh, uh, issue on this i think it should just be diabetes uh, and the renal dysfunction characterized by a creatinine greater than 
and uh, ischemic heart disease has been defined and uh, they say it's a history of mi or a positive exercise test person complaining of chest pain second uh, which is definitely of myocardial origin use of a nitrate therapy evidence of pathological q waves on ecg and just a revascularization in the past without these symptoms does not categorize them with history of ischemic heart disease they had ischemic heart disease which has been taken care of so that is something that you need to keep in mind and uh, lee himself looked at it and that is from where we got this idea that somebody with uh, two or more risk factor has a higher risk if you look at it no risk factor the risk is similar to what would be an asa ps2 one risk factor there is some amount of it two risk factors it goes up significantly and more than two three or more risk factors it is even higher and this was again shown by a study which was later on done by devaru similar thing two or risk risk factors and three or high uh, three or more the risk is much much higher and uh, if you, th this was looked at in 2013 and uh, this gives you a comprehensive like and makes you understand that why we are bothered in that reverse cardiac risk index that if a person has two it is worrying if it is three or more it is indeed very very worrying so and that gives you an idea and, and helps you in decision making and this is across most surgeries orthopedic surgeries abdominal surgeries thoracic surgeries other vascular surgeries and the only place that it has not worked in is in pace persons are uh, undergoing a major vascular surgery like an abdominal aortic aneurysm and if you want to look at risk assessment then you have to look at the vsgne or the vqi cardiac risk index which is specifically for vascular surgeries uh, it essentially has nearly everything they have added increased age smoking uh, abnormal stress stress long term beta blocker therapy copds along with whatever was also there in the rcri so if you are looking at uh, risk indices for vascular these are the indices to go to and uh, this is something which is uh, i think uh, it might be helpful if you can use it uh, uh, just visit the american college of surgeries nsquip uh, data uh, the website and uh, then you will get to a page like this where you choose what procedure that the person is uh, undergoing then the patient characteristics like, like age functional status whether it is an emergency what is the asa physical status uh, what kind of wound is it a clean wound or a uh, uh, or a or a dirty wound has the person been on medications like steroid does the patient have sepsis is the patient uh, coming with a ventilator on what is the bmi is he a smoker and then you kind of create uh, outcome and it gives you individually can uh, whether the person can have a serious complication or a pneumonia surgical site infection thromboembolism renal failure and a composite kind of a risk and tell you that whether the person is in the expected risk for that particular procedure or the risk is more again it gives you objective numbers and uh, it can help you in decision making so that is about nsquip and the take home is or decision making is that patients with a low risk which is less than 1% from both the patient characteristics as well as the surgery when put together you possibly do not need any further cardiac testing and the person can go ahead and undergo the non cardiac surgery those with a higher risk you will have to take a call should i do a cardiovascular change or testing will that cardiovascular testing change the way i manage the patient and hopefully improve the outcome not just the surgical outcome the long term outcome as well or can it help me in possibly in some ex, uh, situation risk prognostication and stratification as well so further testing is just not done because there is another test available it is not done to uh, just lower the uh, the risk for the surgical outcome but it's for the long term 
and you would have anyway done this additional testing whether or not the person who was coming in for a non cardiac surgery or not and uh, there are only few circumstances when you can do this for as i said risk prognostication and stratification so from this the decision making i think this is uh, i think one of the most important slides in this uh, presentation is to decide whether i proceed without further cardiovascular testing or do i postpone the surgery temporarily do additional testing like a stress testing lv evaluation or whatever and then decide based upon it do i need to optimize further and then proceed or do we take a uh, consensus decision the cardiologist the surgeon you anesthesiologist with the patient patient relative that you might be better off by doing a lesser risk possible or even possibly a non surgical alternative for that given clinical condition or the fourth option could be that this person yes needs the surgery can be done but before then i need to fix the cardiac problem whether it is a coronary revascularization or an heart valve replacement and then go ahead and do the non cardiac surgery so this entire what are the risks you do the risk assessment is to come to these possible four scenarios that you can you have to decide on so again the management based on risk is uh, whether the patient is at low or high risk and the surgery whether it is emergency and what the timing of surgery and uh, this is again something that acc aha gave us a little bit which i have modified for my own liking you decide first what is the timing of surgery then you try to find out whether the patient has an acute coronary syndrome or an active cardiac condition then you apply uh if it is no then you apply the risk uh, one of the risk models the rcri or nsquip whatever and figure out whether it is low risk and then you think of proceeding for surgery or is it elevated risk if it is elevated risk make this uh, uh, uh estimation of the functional capacity previously met today possibly dasi uh then think of shall i do further testing and if i do for the testing how much is it going to influence my perioperative care if the answer is no then if i am optimized proceed to surgery with goal directed medical therapy and if from your tests as you said and that was the fourth part of it yes no i cannot proceed for a non cardiac surgery without fixing the cardiac problem the person needs revascularization or replacement and only then comes in for surgery so this is the management and i will take you through this so like the patient is scheduled for a surgery with a known risk factor if it is an emergency surgery i think the decision making is clear cut that the person goes in with clinical risk stratification uh, hemodynamic goals and you proceed for surgery so the decision making is easier if it is not an emergency surgery the next question you ask is does the patient have acute coronary syndrome or an active cardiac condition now if the person has an active cardiac condition then obviously it will be different if the person you find that is a non emergency surgery no active cardiac condition you apply the risk models find out the estimated perioperative risk based upon the combined again the patient and the surgery you can have two things it can be either low risk or an elevated risk if it is low risk you just proceed to surgery the person does not need any further testing now the thing can be that the person has an active cardiac condition or acute coronary syndrome you have to then evaluate the non cardiac surgery has to wait evaluate treat according to the goal directed medical therapy and then apply the risk models figure out whether it is low risk and then elevated risk and if it is an elevated risk as i said find out the functional status what is the met score this acc aha has been based upon the met scores maybe we need to change it and get to the dasi scores if it is uh, 
a match score which is four, greater than four, like able to do uh, high strenuous physical activity, then no further testing. What else would you want to find out? The neuroendocrine stress response, the inflammatory stress response of the card of the non-cardiac surgery, the person can well handle it and you can proceed for cardiac surgery. If it is poor or unknown, this is when the second decision making comes. Shall I do further testing? Will it impact my decision making of perioperative care? Will it be yes or no? If it is, you decide a no. And we'll come through scenarios where you will figure it out. So it typically happens when you are looking at uh, high equity cancer surgeries uh, that you do not have the time for uh, uh, doing things like revascularization or replacement. Then we proceed to surgery with goal directed medical therapy or then we don't think, no, surgery cannot be an option for this. We have to think about alternative strategies or palliative strategies. Uh, if it is going to impact your perioperative care, then you do further testing, things like pharmacological stress testing. And if the pharmacological stress testing is normal, it gives you more confidence, it gives you more strength, and you proceed for surgery, again, with the goal-directed medical therapy or whatever. The pharmacological stress testing proves that it is very, very bad. And uh, then you, again, think about giving alternative strategies. It's an abnormal pharmacological strategies. And then you have decided, no, the non-cardiac surgery cannot happen without fixing the cardiac problem, revascularization or replacement of valves, and then proceed for non-cardiac surgery. And this is the algorithm that has been used. And uh, you heard about further cardiac testing. What is there in further cardiac testing? And we have kept on repeating this, that it can be done uh, only when you would have anyway done with with or without the uh, surgery coming into the equation and uh, this is again to find out the burden of the disease the burden of the valvular disease uh, and uh, the what is the reason of this arrhythmias which is causing symptoms that is what the uh, functional uh, further testing is being done uh, there comes a question i think this accha kind of brought it up is the 12 lead ECG should it for free for everyone and uh, the 2014 kind of tells you that yes cardiovascular disease anybody undergoing a surgery which is the risk of mace of greater than one percent should un have a, a baseline ECG it's only in asymptomatic or of the mess of less than one percent that you can think of not doing a 12 lead ECG pre-op our take is that we would do it in everybody with some history of cardiovascular disease because that is the one of the baseline that is available if it was not available and on which to base upon uh, in case there is a post-operative uh, 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 aberration that is happening to fall back upon whether there has been any change to the baseline ACG. Who needs LV evaluation? I go back again to the ACC AHA 2014. It, it, this is again, this is very intuitive. Anybody with a dyspnea of unknown origin should get an LV evaluation with current or prior heart failure, worsening uh, clinical condition, worsening dyspnea should get a LV evaluation. And uh, this is what you would have possibly not done uh, without the surgery that there was a documented LV dysfunction. And some people say if it has not been recorded in the last six months, and uh, ACCHA says uh, one year, that if there is a, a, a role of getting a echocardiography for LV evaluation done. It should not be as per the ACCHA 2014, be done routinely preoperatively. When to do stress testing? Again, I'll go back to the ACCHA classification. Somebody with uh, RCRI 2 or above uh, risk index, a MET score which is less than 4, undergoing an intermediate or a major cardiac surgery with a MACE score uh, with a MACE of more than 1% should undergo a, a non invasive pharmacological stress testing. And again, as we figured out, if it changes my management. If it is not going to change my management, people say that, that and then it's a waste of time. To change of management, what I can possibly say, many people use it to further risk prognosticate and risk stratify. Uh, 
what has come in to other than this uh, this kind of testing is the role of preoperative uh, beta natriotic peptide testing and has been used in conjunction with the risk models and uh, it gives you an objective number anything above a number of 400 in a distinct patient it is definitely possibly due to heart failure a risk a score of less than 100 has a very high negative pred predictive value for that heart failure is not the cause of dyspnea you have to look for other causes of dyspnea uh, NT pro BNP in normal subjects both are nearly the same. If LV dysfunction, the NT pro BNP are approximately fourfold higher than the BNP, and uh, NT pro BNP below 300 is uh, like, just like that was 400 is optimal for excluding a diagnosis of heart failure. So heart failure is something that is should be bothering you. And if there is a person with a decompensated heart failure, all non-cardiac surgery has to stop. It has to be optimized before you take that person in for surgery. And this is even for an urgent non-cardiac surgery with three arms, stable, a patient with a new onset or acute decompensated heart failure, or a person with refractory heart failure. What do you do with it? If it is a stable heart failure, uh, then somebody who has a mace of 1%, less than 1%, you can possibly go ahead with surgery. Not decompensated, not refractory heart failure, stable heart failure. If it is new onset or acutely decompensated and uh, urgent surgery means you have around six to 24 hours, try to stabilize that in the next six to 24 hours. If they can be stabilized and if a mace is less than 1%, then you can possibly proceed for surgery. If you cannot stabilize, then you continue therapy and you'll have to really think, shall this patient, should this patient go ahead for a non-cardiac surgery? The same is about refractory heart failure. It, uh, you continue therapy and you reassess and think, is there going to be a benefit from the surgery? Does the patient have another other options, uh, palliative options, and uh, uh, think about a non-surgical therapy? So non-stabilized, decompensated heart failure, refractory heart failure, think very hard before you take these patients up for even an urgent non-cardiac surgery. Uh, heart failure with elective, uh, non elective non-cardiac surgery, again, if it is stable, mace less than one percent you possibly uh, don't even have to do further cardiac testing go ahead with the non-cardiac surgery uh, new onset heart failure waiting for a uh, elective surgery where you can wait for a month maybe six weeks or so you have to try and stabilize that and then look at the functional assessment and then decide what is the risk benefit analysis the take home is new onset uh, heart failure treat it for at least a couple of months or three months and then decide for an elective non-cardiac surgery if it is acutely decompensated heart failure again that was three months at least try to treat it for a month before an elective non-cardiac surgery and unless they are refractory or if they get refractory again it is the same thing you have to Think very hard before you take this person up for an elective non-cardiac surgery. Think about other options. Uh, murmurs, we'll quickly run through this. Uh, it could be undiagnosed systolic murmurs or diastolic murmurs, which is very, very common. A systolic murmur with a, a symptom of dyspnea, chest pain, history of syncope, uh, and an ECG abnormality, look at the heart and get an expert evaluation before you take this person up. Any diastolic murmur is pathological and warrants further evaluation because things like mitral stenosis has definite impact on poor perioperative outcome. Valvular heart disease, stenotic lesions are much, much more difficult to deal and uh, you will have to figure out how you're going to manage these patients in the intraoperative period. Invasive monitoring, which goes in into the post-operative period and you have to look at proper institutions where you can actually do it. Uh, like aortic stenosis, the severity of the disease, again, it can be asymptomatic with a severe disease. Uh, anybody with a gradient of more than 60 with an orifice area less than one centimeter, 
or they can be asymptomatic severe AS with a low ejection fraction of less than 50% or they can be symptomatic severe aortic stenosis. Uh, the, uh, along with that, if they have certain other like a coronary artery, art, art, artery disease, the risk becomes much, much more. And uh, you will have to really think hard before you think of taking these patients if they are symptomatic for a non-cardiac surgery. Uh, if they're not symptomatic and you think that this person will benefit from the non-cardiac surgery, then appropriate monitoring into the post-operative period, asympto asymptomatic severe AS may be taken up. Asymptomatic AS without other another valvular disorder and a significant coronary artery disease may be taken up with an increased risk for a non-cardiac procedure. If it is symptomatic, uh, non-cardiac surgery, elective non-cardiac surgery should wait and the person's valves needs to be taken care of. So whether it would do a surgical AVR or a transcathetic AVR, balloon mitral valvuloplasty, not much popular, but that needs to be fixed before you take up. About mitral stenosis, again, the operating word is not just the severity of the disease based upon the valve hemo anatomy or valve hemodynamics, just like aortic stenosis. Uh, just like a mitral valve orifice area of less than 1.5 centimeter with a PA pressure which is more than 30 uh, would keep still and still asymptomatic but severe versus a person who has decreased uh, exercise tolerance and exertional dyspnea, the ball game is completely different. Uh, asymptomatic without pulmonary hypertension and atrial fibrillation possibly many people say there is no excessive risk as long as you do and follow the hemodynamic goals uh, which is heart rate control bl blood volume control and uh, vascular resistance control and uh, there is a group which is coming in who says that even with in severe ms but who are asymptomatic with a favorable valve anatomy to be taken up for a moderate to high risk non cardiac surgery, there is possibility of roll off preoperative percutaneous balloon mitral valvotomy. Unfavorable uh, anatomy, asymptomatic severe AS, it may be reasonable to proceed with a moderate uh, risk, again, with the same hemodynamic goals. But the, again, the same thing as was with a aortic stenosis, if it is symptomatic, I think the valve needs to be addressed. Uh, regurgitant valves, AR, MR, typically tolerated better than the stenotic lesions. Again, let's look at what are the predictors for increased cardiovascular risk in patients with a moderate to severe MR or chronic AR. Uh, it's LV function, uh, associated fibrillation or an ischemic MR along with it, and comorbidities like diabetes, carotid endectomy. To chronic AR, it is again the same thing plus renal dysfunction and lack of perioperative management. Uh, valve surgery prior to uh, non-cardiac, uh, when do these regurgitation lesions need to be taken care of? Again, it is if they are symptomatic. And with even with, with preserved LV function, if they're symptomatic, they need to be taken care of. If it is asymptomatic, but with uh, diminished LV function, or a high LV dimension for an MR or an AR, with, which is again symptomatic or asymptomatic with depressed ejection fraction. Or if you see that there is a bicuspid aortic valve, then they might need to be intervened. The problem with valve surgery prior to non cardiac surgery is that it may not always be visible, especially when you're looking at time sensitive surgeries and uh, the then the factor of anticoagulation that also comes in it some patients require an urgent procedure and the risk of the valve and uh, surgery itself is may not be acceptable for many and they therefore decline it so regard uh, when is it reasonable to proceed i think the operating thing is symptoms symptomatic severe mrar urgent down card you have to really take a hard call and then decide whether you go in or not Mechanical heart valves, it's the role of when to interrupt coagulation, how much is the bleeding risk, should I stop, uh, how much is the thromboembolic risk, should I continue, I think that is a conundrum which needs to be addressed in its own. Uh, 
arrhythmias are all arrhythmias brad uh, the role of just a supraventricular tachycardia asymptomatic even if asymptomatic ventricular arrhythmia how much you need to in intervene is still not known a symptomatic bradycardia mobis type 2 complete heart blocks definitely needs intervention prior to a non cardiac surgery if the commonest arrhythmias possibly that you would encounter clinically stable patients with af you pos thing is if you go by recommendations without a rapid ventricular rate you possibly and uh, just by modification of anticoagulation you might proceed for a non cardiac surgery and but uh, af that has been recently found out or a recently diagnosed it has to be evaluated before you take this person off for non cardiac surgeries i'll just close with certain case scenarios to just take you through the uh, uh, the the uh, management algorithm i know we are getting late uh, so this was what we decided that the stepwise algorithm let's put in a, a case scenario this is a 56 year old with pain abdomen tenderness rigidity septic in metabolic acidosis has a twisted ovary and cyst complaints of chest pain even at rest breathless on day to day work ischemic heart disease hypertensive diabetes tachycardic bp is okay on nitrates aspirin atenolol uh, diuretics insulin anterolateral ischemia bilateral pleural effusion so what do you do now twisted ovary and cyst cyst is the operating word so what is the type of surgery timing of surgery this is an emergency surgery so for an emergency surgery the rest of the algorithm does not come into question you straight away proceed for surgery with goal directed medical therapy now suppose i tweak it and say that the same lady does not have a twisted ovary and cyst is diagnosed with an ovary and cyst same chest pain at rest breathless on day to day work same parameters now apply the algorithm what is the timing of surgery it is an time sensitive or an elective surgery does the patient have an acute coronary syndrome or an active cardiac condition yes the person has then you apply the risk assessment models stabilize the active uh, cardiac condition and figure out whether there is an elevated risk try to find out the functional capacity and then decide on what you want to do uh, whether you need to do further testing will further testing help and then take up but without stabilizing the uh, the uh, the the medical presentation of dyspnea at rest chest pain at rest a non cardiac surgery will need to wait 46 year old bleeding pv the plan is a hysteroscopy angina on severe exertion not breathless with regular activity diabetic hypertensive good heart rate control good blood pressure control what do you do next let's apply the algorithm again the surgery is time sensitive the person does not have an ac acute coronary syndrome you apply the risk model it's a hysteroscopy not very invasive low risk shall i proceed for surgery in this person uh, do you think you should uh, do further testing i think you just apply the goal directed medical therapy and go ahead with the surgery uh fibroid uterus needing a hysterectomy angina breathless occasionally ischemic heart disease on medication the only thing is she also has osteoarthritis of the knee unable to walk climb stairs uh and is a little tachycardic what next apply this algorithm no she does not have acs apply the model this is an invasive surgery functional capacity is uh, you cannot determine because of the osteoarthritis of the knee then comes the question should i do further testing that again has to be decided by a consensus opinion between the cardiologist the surgeon yourself the patient and relative that do i do pharmacological stress testing just for risk prognostication or if the pharmacological stress testing shows something there is that is wrong should i fix it and then take up the person for surgery again very very individualized so that is about it and uh, with that we will wind up with the answers to the poll questions i could figure out that uh, uh, 
I think uh, most of you got most of it absolutely correct. And this is very, very simple. Which of it is not true? Of course, the type of surgery does influence the risk of perioperative cardiac outcome. I think more than 70% people uh, voted for this. And uh, which is not a part of the revised cardiac risk in this. I think if people have got so used to this, it is absolutely simple. Hypertension does not figure in it. So it is the type of surgery, congestive heart failure, cerebrovascular disease, insulin on diabetes, and a creatinine of greater than 2 milligram per DL. Okay. I think this also, the many people would uh, have done what I would have thought I would do. CABG, COPD, gallstone pancreatitis. Uh, I think these are the things that need to be fixed. The CCS of 4 and the NIH of 3, the heart rate of 98. Send it, of course, get a cardiology consultation. Optimize the medical management if you can get them down to around 2, a heart rate around 70, less than 80, and then decide to proceed for surgery. So this is possibly what most of you also would have done i figured out and uh, stenotic valve severely stenotic valve less than 1.5 centimeter but asymptomatic no shortness of breath no functional deterioration but has a <laughs> needs surgery for ca ovary what should be your approach uh, I think uh, most of you got this again right, is heart rate control and then proceed for surgery. Thank you very much. And I think uh, we will take up questions now. Gorov, is there something that you had to answer before I... can see... Uh, Dr. Kusuma Parekh has a question. Patient with CA bladder with hematuria with a history of chest pain 15 days back. Angiography showing triple vessel block was advised CABG. Should we go ahead? You should run away from that patient. Uh, CA bladder with hematuria, you need to actually... Uh, uh, take a call on this because uh, you, you need some kind of an intervention because uh, whatever if you do uh, whether you do whatever revascularization whether it is C, uh, CABG or you do a percut cutaneous revascularization you will definitely give uh, antiplatelets and uh, the bleeding from the CA bladder will uh, possibly worsen at the same time if you do not address the triple vessel coronary artery disease uh, especially with uh, somebody who has documented uh, chest pain, has uh, a, a chance of having an adverse perioperative event. I think you have to, uh, the urologist, yourself, the patient and the patient relative needs to sit down. Is there any other way that you can uh, possibly manage the bleeding? Is there any other uh, lesser intervention kind of a modality to uh, address that is uh, I think something that you can think of and otherwise I think it could be medical management if you've got the go uh, goal directed medical therapy again heart rate control blood pressure control symptom control uh, take away the bleeding fr from the patient's pathophysiology and then possibly think of a long-term uh, solution to the triple vessel coronary artery disease. That would be how I would look at. Uh, oh. Professor Amna Goswami, thank you, ma'am, for being with us. Uh, she wants. Uh, she had a question: Is is prolonged beta blocker therapy looked upon as a risk factor? Many of us are there for now. I don't think prolonged beta blocker uh, therapy is to be looked down upon as a risk factor. Uh, I, I, I think the, the, the only the the, v, the vascular surgery group said that prolonged beta blocker is a risk if they are undergoing beta, uh, uh, vascular major vascular surgeries. Other than that, uh, the only thing is if you have been on prolonged beta blocker therapy, you need to continue beta blocker therapy into the perioperative period. Uh, Manoj Guskwetspen, how much is the resting eco helpful? How do we? Uh, what do we? 
need to know beyond the ejection fraction. I think uh, ejection fraction is the first thing that you look at, but there are other things that you need to look at from the resting echocardiography. I would be looking at the diastolic dysfunction because the diastolic dysfunction, especially uh, two grade two and above, especially three and above, uh, have been known to cause significant uh, hemodynamic problems in the perioperative period. So I would be looking at diastolic dysfunction. I would be looking at definitely the wall motion activity, the valves, and uh, the surrounding of the the uh, the chambers, the pericardium. So those are the things that I would, the information that I would try to find out from the resting echocardiography. Plus, uh, is there anything that I can understand from the pulmonary arterial pressures? Uh, so. Uh, that that is from the resting echocardiography and essentially the stress testing is nothing like like the dobutamine stress testing you are just stressing the heart and to fi find out that when you are when the when you, you are subjecting the patient to a physiological stress how much the the heart copes with it i think uh, that is all that you would try to find out from the lv function uh, dr raghu has a question as to how to assess functional reserve in geriatric patients posted intermediate uh, risk surgery the if you go by again if you go by the, the met scores both them would have a score of less than four if you go the dash you'll get them to have a score of then so you obviously they they and plus uh, age a is an independent uh, risk factor for adverse perioperative outcomes so I, I and uh, really what else would you try to do if you are trying to do a six minute walk test to find out the cardiopulmonary exercise reserve it will be extremely difficult and they will fare very poorly on that as well so uh, i i really don't know what else do you want what can find find out um, uh, again a stress echocardiography just for the sake of uh, risk prognostic and stratification you might do it, it uh, to tell you whether uh, in any uh, wall is showing uh, wall motion changes or if you even if you'd want to do a thallium scan to pick up areas where uh, where their perfusion is less but then again for a geriatric would that person or the person relative or possibly even the surgeon be willing to fix that problem and then take up for the non-cardiac surgery so i don't think you will have a, just a simple one-off answer to this i think that's it uh, from my end uh we will close and uh, again i would request that you will get a email from the hcp forum and kolkata anesthesia academy I would be uh, very very happy to uh uh uh, know what you felt about this what topics you think you can uh, needs to be addressed in the future how we can get better how we can look better uh, not only not necessarily our slides how can our uh, mug shots look better as well and thank you Gorov. and i would ask uh, dr jati to make the uh, concluding comments Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Shoykot and Dr. Gaurav for the wonderful presentation. And thank you for the audience, uh, for a lovely audience. And uh, thank you for all the queries. We'll like to uh, have you in future also for our future webinars. And you will get a mail from us for the feedback and the certification thing. So please reply to the feedback and you will get the certificate accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Anyway, thank you, HCP Forum, for being uh, taking care of the back end. And uh, it's good to see that a lot of our friends from even across the border, I can see Dr. Luthful Aziz thanking us. Thank you, Luthful, for being there. We had Dr. Chakra Rao, who was there. We had Dr. Kanchi Muralidhar, who was with us. Thank you. And we had Dr. Amna Goswami, who is always with us. Uh, and a uh, lot of senior people and a lot of our students some of them i can recognize some of them i cannot thank you for there being there we'll try and uh, come up with something again next friday or maybe a uh, friday after that and with that i think i will sign off and close the session for tonight good night bye bye take care yeah and uh, happy eve to all of you so i don't know what is there in the platter for you 
at night but uh, maybe there is something make justice to the day celebration thank you